Hi A4, hope you're all okay. Um, I'm here to read the next chapter, chapter 9, which is called A Tight Leash. Unfortunately, Cass's mother seemed to think that her absence meant Cass should have less freedom rather than more. A week after she brought the news about her trip, even though she was late for the airport, her mother spent 20 minutes listening to all the things Cass wasn't allowed to do while she was gone, including sliding down the fire pole and riding in the back of Wayne's pickup truck. Cass's mother pushed a credit card into Cass's hand. For emergencies, she said. But there better not be any. Then she turned towards Cass's substitute grandfathers. And now substitute guardians. Remember, she's not an ad- as adult as she seems. She's still our little girl. Which was just which was just about as m- the most infuriating thing her mother could say. Don't worry, we'll keep her on a tight leash, said Grandpa Larry. Which made Cass even madder. Yeah, Sebastian has a, f- has a few extras, joked Grandpa Wayne. She- which was so unfunny, it wasn't funny. Apparently, keeping Cass on a tight leash meant dragging her around with them wherever they went. As soon as her mother left, Grandpa Larry and Grandpa Wayne started filling all all her out-of-school time with trips to flea markets and swamp meets and garage sales and junkyards. They said they were just checking out the competition, but Cass noticed they never left anywhere empty-handed. After two days with them, Cass never wanted to see another old or broken thing for the rest of her life. Still, the field trips were a relief compared to the time she spent in the shop. Whenever she was at the fire station, Cass worried that Gloria might show up and tell her grandfathers about seeing Cass at the magician's house. What had Gloria called her? A trespasser and a thief? Hearing those words would be enough to get her grandfathers to call her mother, and to get her mother to cancel the rest of her trip, and to get Cass in pretty much the biggest trouble she'd ever been in. Unable to bear the suspense any longer, Cass asked her grandfather if they had heard anything from Gloria. Oh, don't you worry, she always comes back, said Grandpa Wayne, completely misinterpreting Cass's concern. And I'm sure she'll have plenty of loot. Maybe she'll even have a new adding machine for us. Wouldn't that be cool? Cass wasn't sure what could be less cool than a new adding machine, unless it was the way Grandpa Wayne said the word cool. In any case, his answer did not reassure her. But Gloria stayed away that day, and the next, and the next. Gradually, Cass's anxiety about Gloria reappearing was replaced by a new anxiety. An anxiety about Gloria disappearing. What if Dr Ella and Ms Marve had done something to her? Was that why Gloria hadn't dropped by the shop? And more Cass thought, the more Cass thought about it, the more certain Cass became that Gloria had met some terrible fate. The magician's house was so remote, Gloria's body might rot there for years and nobody would know. When the next Saturday arrived, Cass's grandfathers announced that it was time for them to take their once-a-year inventory. Each and, every, each and every single thing in the store had to be counted. Cass could only imagine what this would be like. The store was so disorganised that it would take an entire year to catalogue its contents, and then it would be time for next year's inventory. She couldn't ask for a better opportunity to return to the magician's house and resume her edu- her, her investigation. As if she were just trying to be helpful, she offered to take Sebastian for a walk while her grandfathers were working. They accepted on condition that she not stay out too long. Cass knew they'd lose track of time as soon as they got started on the inventory, so she readily agreed. She even promised to clean up after the dog. Being blind, Sebastian had a tendency to go about his business in inconvenient places. There was one thing she had to do before she left. In case her grandfathers were more efficient about taking inventory than she imagined, Cass stealthily removed the symphony of smells from her backpack and slipped it back on the shelf where Grandpa Larry had last stored it. Probably they wouldn't look, but it was better to be careful. Besides, her backpack was heavy enough as it was. The magician's notebook, of course, she kept. No way was she leaving that. Then she said a loud goodbye and headed out with Sebastian. The morning was sunny and windy, which was one of Cass's favourite weather combinations. And she was happy and excited about the day ahead of her. She also liked it when the weather was sunny and rainy at the same time, which is when you're most likely to see a rainbow. However, mud would have to have made it difficult to dig, so it was a good thing it was raining. Mentally, Cass went 
over her list of supplies. She took down her own inventory, so to speak, until she was satisfied that she had everything she needed, from the collapsible shovel to her extra plastic bags for picking up dog poop. In no time at all, Cass felt confident she and Max Ernest would find whatever it was the magician had buried in the ground. She only hoped they didn't find the magician, or Gloria, buried along with it. When she reached Max Ernest's house, Cass hit a snag. Max Ernest was standing in the driveway, flipping a coin in the air. On one side of him, his mother sat in her car. On the other side of him, his father sat in his car. OK, heads I go with Mum, tails I go with Dad, he was saying as Cass walked up to him. This was the way Max Ernest made any decisions concerning his parents, so he didn't have to pick a favourite. The coin fell to the ground before he could grab it. Oh, Dan, you made me mess it up, he said to Cass. Well, that's okay, because you're not going with either of your parents. You're going with me, said Cass. We're going back to the magician's house, she added in a whisper. We can't. I'm going to a new doctor, Max Ernest whispered back. Tell them it's important. But he thinks he knows what my condition is. I have to go. Well then, I'll just have to go to the magician's house without you, said Cass, very displeased with the turn of events. You'd go without me? asked Max Ernest in alarm. Don't worry, I know how to handle myself, said Cass, which was a line she had once heard in a movie. That's not what I meant, said Max Ernest. I thought we were partners. You said we were collaborating. Cass immediately bristled at this suggestion. I never said that. That was just something to tell our parents. We're not even really building that volcano. I'm a survivalist, remember? I don't count on anybody but myself. Oh, well, I've never counted on anybody either. Something about the way he said this. Maybe it was the fact that tears were welling in his eyes. Made Cass think twice. Although Cass liked to think of herself as a fearless adventurer, she also wanted to be fair-minded. Technically, it was true. She had never ag- agreed to collaborate with Max Ernest on the investigation, but she had acted like they were the collaborators and it amounted to the same thing. Almost. Maybe he was right. She shouldn't go without him. After a few seconds of intense, whispered negotiation, they agreed to go back to the magician's house on Monday after school. Even if it meant having to skip the oboe lesson, Cass, and a mathletes math meeting, Max. Disappointed but res- resigned, Cass turned around and headed back to the firehouse. When she got there, she let Sebastian off his leash and opened the big red front door. Usually, Sebastian would run in at this point and head for the kitchen in search for food. This time, Sebastian hesitated at the door, refusing to enter when Cass tried to nudge him in. What's wrong? Don't you want your breakfast? You know, food, eat. Cass waited until he finally entered the store, but he kept growling and turning his head this way and that, as if trying to catch an elusive scent. Cass looked inside. Everything was the way it was when she left it. It didn't look as though her grandfathers had made any headway in the inventory. Grandpa Larry? Grandpa Wayne? Nobody answered. Cass could remember the firehouse being so couldn't remember the firehouse be ever been so silent. She called their names again. Something was wrong. Her instincts told her to turn and leave, and leave as fast as she could. Which is exactly what she should have done, and what you and I should do if we ever find ourselves in her situation. But what if her grandfathers were bound and gagged and locked in a closet and she could have saved them, but she didn't? Or what if they were lying in the kitchen, breathing their last breath, and she could have been there to hear their dying wishes, but she wasn't? Or what if... Instead of entering quietly, Cass made a lot of noise as she walked in. She talked loudly loudly to Sebastian. She banged on furniture. She figured if the bad guys heard her, maybe they'd sneak out to avoid being seen. It was never than it was better than surprising them and having them knock her unconscious in a moment of panic. For about ten tense minutes, Cass searched the firehouse. She had never realised how many hiding places there were in her grandfather's store, how many wardrobes to climb into and tables to climb under. Even so, it looked like her strategy had worked. The bad guys had left when they heard her. Or else they'd already left. Or else they'd never been there. Her grandfathers were not tied up in a closet. There was no blood in the kitchen floor. Everything seemed to be okay. Except for the fact that her grandfathers were missing. Then she heard a loud bang. 
It sounded like gunfire. Oh dear. The next chapter is called An Awful Accusation. <laughs> 